well, I don't know everybody well. Uh, I don't know Juan. And, oh, I know. Okay, Peter. Hello, welcome. Hello, Peter. Uh, and I, I've met Henry a few times. Uh, and uh, but uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't say I know you well, Henry. But. Wow, that hurts. <laughs> well, blame COVID and also the fact <laughs> that we don't go to the same school. But yeah, that, uh, that'll do it. Yeah. Um, but uh, re regardless uh, regardless of how well I know anybody, uh, welcome to this talk. Um, hopefully it will not be a disaster. Um, and uh, so this is DFT with applications, uh, emphasis on the applications. Now I do have to give a disclaimer that uh, I did not really know the, you know, the underpinnings of, of DFT until somewhat recently. The only reason I actually started doing DFT is for this, uh, for a project on plasmonics that uh, turned out to need quite a bit of first principles calculations. Uh, we started working on it uh, initially just with, you know, some simple type binding models. And uh, it turned out that a lot of the aspects of the system because of the, and I'll go into why exactly it was necessary to go into a more first principles calculation, but a lot of the aspects of the system, some unexpected magnetization, um, kind of required a more thorough uh, approach. Um, and so here, uh, just as a fun joke, I have a BA and an MS, and then these are uh, exchange correlation functionals. Uh, they're not degrees, but uh, maybe one day they will be. Um, and, we'll, and we'll go into those more later on. Um, uh, also, I'll keep this, I, I can do full screen if you guys want, but I also have some, uh, uh, Julia notebooks here that with some actual calculations that I can show you guys later if you're interested, uh, which is why I kept it open. Um, so to kind of get an understanding of DFT, uh, you know, DFT, it's, it's all in the name. It's a density functional theory. So density refers to electron density, functional. I think pretty much everybody here knows what a functional is. But uh, for a simple example of this, uh, you can go into the Thomas Fermi theory. And this is literally uh, copy pasted from Wikipedia because they did a good job of explaining what, what it actually is. And so, um, but it's not plagiarism technically because I just cited it. Um, but so for instance, uh, if you have a degenerate Fermi gas, right? You have, uh, um, uh, a, you have a Fermi momentum that corresponds to the uh, highest momentum of the electrons in that Fermi gas. And using this uh, and using a classical description of what the um, kinetic energy of the system is, you can write a functional uh, of the uh, of the density of the system in order to get the total energy. Uh, and this is sort of, in a way, what DFT is doing. It's, it's writing the energy as a functional of the density and then uh, varying uh, the energy with respect to that density. Um, so first and foremost, we should probably go into how accurate uh, DFT is. Um, so this is kind of a difficult question to answer. In, in the vast majority of cases, it is uh, very good in terms of predicting things like lattice parameters, uh, I guess, predicting, uh, yeah, bond lengths, you know, things of that sort. It doesn't predict things like high temperature superconductivity or superconductivity all that well. Although, as I'll show later on, it can predict some, uh, some things uh, related to, you know, superconducting systems. Um, it is a fairly simple theory in the, in the sense that it, it's the assumptions that go into it uh, are not really that uh, unbelievable if you believe quantum mechanics, right? Um, but it, it does fail to describe certain things, like for instance, where we're currently doing some DFT calculations on a, a defect system where we have these self-trapped holes in silica. And depending on the initial conditions of the system, the hole localization can change, the uh, uh, humo, lumo, or whatever, Thing is the optical gap can change, uh, and so with question with uh, situations like that, you need you really need to go into more depth as to you know what pseudo potentials you're using, and I'll define what a pseudo potential is later on. 
uh, what sorts of exchange correlation functionals you're using, the cutoffs that you're using in the system. So basically, it's a hard question to answer as to how accurate it is. Obviously, people who work on DFT like to go on and on about how great it is, right? But um, if you're using it for a certain application and it doesn't really uh, help you, then it's, it's a little hard to be, uh, to be a proponent of it, I guess. Uh, but in most cases, it, it is actually, uh, it's certainly better than just guessing. I'll, I'll say that. Um, so let's go into exactly what, what DFT does. Um, so <clears throat> the density uh, is basically, as the name would suggest, the, the main thing that we're concerned with in this system, because most observables uh, in an electronic system uh, can be considered uh, as, <clears throat> as, as functions of the density. So as long as you get the density correct, then you can uh, get a lot of the uh, observables of the system uh, correct as well. You know, you can get the uh, cone sham eigenvalues and uh, eigenvectors and using those, you can get things that, for instance, I'm interested in, like uh, the uh, non-local dielectric functions and using that, you can get uh, very um, uh, relevant properties of a system like, uh, does it support surface plasmons? Uh, how fast do those plasmons decay? You know, stuff like that. Um, and so <clears throat> the total energy uh, that we are basically minimizing, um, and I have an expression for it later on, uh, there's uh, a kinetic energy part, there's a Coulomb interaction part, there is Pauli exclusion, which you know, and typically when you're, uh, if you're just doing analytics, right, you know, if you have a degenerate Fermi gas uh, to zero order, you know what the total energy of the system is, it's just that uh, kinetic energy, but then you want to do perturbation theory. Uh, and then you, uh, from that, you have this uh, exchange, these exchange terms basically coming from the, um, coming from the electron-electron interactions. Um, but, uh, it's actually not a foregone conclusion what even, for instance, the expression for the kinetic energy would be if you don't uh, simplify this uh, using the cone sham method. Because, for instance, if you have a strongly electric, a strongly interacting uh, set of, uh, you know, many body set of electrons, right? It's not really that simple to, to say, you know, what the total wave function is, what, uh, expressions you should be using in order to get uh, all of these energies. Um, but things are fairly simplified um, by this, uh, by considering these, these cone sham states. So basically, cone and sham basically, and Walter Cohn, who actually won the, uh, the Nobel Prize for DFT, um, they basically uh, are assuming a, a non-interacting limit where you're considering uh, the total wave function of the system to be a Slater determinant of these cone sham single particle states. Um, and, uh, I mean, that, that, that's basically, that's basically it. So this is what, what the total energy of the system would be. So if you consider these to be, uh, a Slater determinant of these single particle, uh, states, then you would have this expression for the kinetic energy. You would have this for the um, interaction between the nuclei of the system, which we take to be which we take to be fixed, uh, as and uh, we take this to be the um, uh, electron electron uh, interactions. And then with this, you can write the uh, electron density as so, where this psi is again that uh, Slater determinant uh, because it's a many body. Um, <clears throat> many body state. So pretty much uh, the only thing that we have to deal with uh, is this exchange correlation energy. Um, uh, so for instance, uh, when did, uh, this zoom thing is in the way. Let me just move it up. Okay. There we go. Okay. So the uh, only thing that we really have to deal with is this exchange correlation energy. Uh, so you, because you have this total uh, kinetic energy here, 
you have this external energy from the neutron uh, from the uh, nuclei. Uh, you have uh, the um, uh, Coulomb interaction, and then you have this exchange correlation. And so basically all of DFT or a lot of DFT is just choosing the, the correct form of this, this exchange correlation. And this is what you get when you actually vary this energy with respect to rho, right? When you vary this uh, energy with respect to rho, you get the, the uh, effective, you know, Schrodinger-like equation that the uh, cone sham orbitals have to obey, which is right here. And I also have it on the next slide. So you have this kinetic energy term, and then basically this VXC, which is this uh, functional derivative of the exchange correlation energy with respect to the electron density, gives you uh, this effective potential that you have to introduce. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's anything new here. So you get two different terms because of this, uh, uh, because in here there's a rho times epsilon of xc. So that's basically the only thing that is uh, of import here. Um, and then you have this issue of uh, self-consistency. So how should you actually solve these uh, Schrodinger-like problems, right? So in DFT, typically what you do is you do a self-consistency calculation. And then after the self-consistency calculation, you do what's called a non-self-consistency calculation uh, in order to get things like del uh, density of states, et cetera. You, obviously you can do the whole thing just with the self-consistency calculation, but it just it, it's to save time. In the non-self-consistency calculation, you use the electron density that you got from the self-consistency uh, calculation, for instance. Um, but basically the way this works is that you make an initial guess for the density, you find the exchange correlation uh, potential because this is a functional of the density. You find the total uh, potential. You solve the cone sham eigenvalue problem, that Schrodinger uh, type question equation. Then you find a new density and you keep repeating this until you either lose a network. That was a joke, but or you get an answer that converges. Um, and <clears throat> so now we get to the to the real to the real meat of the problem, which is, uh, you know, what exchange correlations uh, should you use? So there are, a, a, there's an array that you can choose from. The, there's this local density approximation, which is sometimes referred to as a local spin density uh, approximation. And this is, uh, fair, this is probably the, the, the simplest uh, example uh, that you can use. So here, um, what you do is you map it onto basically a, a, a homogeneous gas with the same density as the local density. And then you just make this row a function of R instead of just being just uh, uh, uniform throughout, basically. So you're basically saying that the, this exchange correlation energy would be the same as whether, if you had mapped that part of the system into a homogeneous electronic gas. Um, and so in this case, this will go as rho to the four thirds. And then when you take a derivative of this with respect to functional derivative of this, it will go as rho to the one third. And so this would be the thing that you would put uh, in your Schrodinger-like uh, equation uh, to do your self-consistency calculation. You can go further uh, and uh, instead of, so rho, so LDA here, it's a functional of rho, but it only uh, it depends locally on rho, right? Now, sometimes you have what are called non-local uh, uh, exchange correlation functionals. It, they're actually not non-local. It's just that they depend on the derivatives or higher order derivatives of the density at that location. So for instance, um, which is still a local property, right? The reason they call them non-local is because, well, you to get the derivative, you need to know the value of rho here and also the rho a little further away. But it's still uh, it's still local. Um, it's a misnomer pretty much that it's not local. But so LDA does not depend on any derivatives. GGA, which is gradient, uh, uh, which is a gradient approximation, generalized gradient approximation, uh, uh, it depends on the gradient as well. 
uh, and then meta GGA goes to second order, and then we have hybrid DFTs, which um, are a, a lot of fun, uh, and they mix in an exact hard Hartree Fock uh, exchange, and then there are also double hybrid DFTs, which I have been uh, fortunate enough not to have to uh, contend with. Um, so yeah, there's there's a whole. I will not really um, claim to know the you know the best uh, use of each. Um, I'll, I'll, I do know, for instance, that uh, so with LDA, in, in some instances, uh, the the GGA is by far the most uh, reliable one that I, that I have found uh, in terms of being able to reproduce results from papers that I've read, for instance, or. Uh, results from other people's works. Uh, the LDA for some of the systems that I've looked at, especially when there is a uh, a spin uh, a flip transition or there there's a uh, splitting of, of of spin states, and sometimes it um, uh, does not um, it underestimates the gap basically. Um, but uh, I, I don't really know enough about the theory of DFT to go into exactly why some of these work best. Um, there is a lot of uh, DFT, the one the one of the good things about DFT is there, there are a lot of papers on it and a lot of them are very highly cited. So a lot of this information, yeah, if you dig up, uh, you can easily uh, get. And the math is not difficult, um, which is also good. Um, so I, I just thought I might, uh, uh, just for fun, uh, show what the uh, exchange correlation functional is for for GGA, which is uh, th uh, this basically. The S here is actually the same as the X here. There, I just took them from two different sources. But see, this, so this depends on uh, the gradient of rho as well as uh, on rho itself. Uh, and so this is actually one of the most uh, used uh, GGA exchange correlation functional. I think this particular one is cited something like 23,000 times. So, uh, you know. Um, what is what is B88 here? Uh, oh, I, I think that a B88, you, you mean just the... Uh, it, yeah, it's it's an exponent over beta or it's... Oh, oh sorry, this is... Th uh, this is just beta is a constant. Yeah, I think beta is a constant and, and then B88 is the, is the name of it. It's the Becky 88. Or uh, maybe Becky was. I know Be Becky did the hybrid uh, exchange function. I'm not sure if I know what B stands for here, but um, yeah, it is. It is. It ha I do remember that this has been cited something like 23,000 times. Um, and so, yeah. So and then obviously for other exchange correlations, you would go in even to higher order. Um, and then you have we have things like uh, uh, hybrid functionals, which I know even less about, but I do know that uh, they were kind of a big deal because it was the first time. So they were they were introduced by uh, Axel Becky, uh, and it was the first time that like DFT was kind of started to be taken seriously for for really accurate um, uh, computations. Um, uh, because uh, in a lot of cases, LDA, GGA can, can I, I believe, um, uh, uh, underestimate the, the, the optical gaps. And, and so hybrid functionals can, can fix that uh, to some degree. The one issue is they take, uh, they, because they involve using um, Hartree-Fock exchange as well, they, and Hartree-Fock exchange takes a very long time. The, these can take a very long time to actually uh, compute, um, which can be a, an issue. Um, so then, uh, so now we've talked about the exchange correlations. We know what the kinetic energy expressions are. We know what the Coulomb interaction is. We know where the neutrons, uh, nuclei of, of the system are. So we know what their uh, potentials are, but that actually, um, gives rise to, a, to another issue, which is how do we uh, exactly um, model these, model these, uh, model the potential from 
both the core electrons and also the uh, the nuclei. Uh, and so this brings us to the topic of, of pseudopotentials. Uh, so pseudopotentials um, uh, are basically a, a, a way of, of computationally uh, uh, representing both the core electrons uh, and the nuclei of the system. Uh, and so you, as you can see here, this is kind of what the pseudo potential would look like in a lot of cases. And then this is what the actual, you know, Z over R potential, uh, where Z is the, uh, you know, the, the atomic charge, the, the charge of the, uh, of the nuclei. Uh, and as you can see here, the uh, wave function that would correspond to, the, to solving this, um, uh, solving the Schrodinger equation for this pseudo potential, uh, it, converges to the true wave function after you um, uh, go past a certain cutoff uh, radius, right? So it, as long as you're past this cutoff radius, then th this pseudo potential is, is totally valid um, to use uh, as an approximation. So one thing uh, uh, that I do wanna uh, stress is there are, there are many different types of pseudo potentials. The main two, kinds uh, and so there are norm conserving and ultra soft i believe there are others as well but those are the main two that you'll be looking at if you choose to do dft but then for each there's also you know non-relativistic and, and uh uh all the, and then the relativistic ones um there's a very good database uh that i can send you guys if, if you want uh a uh, pretty up-to-date a uh, database on the best uh, pseudo potentials uh, for each case. Um, but uh, one thing you do have to take into account, and, and I don't understand this quite that well, but for instance, if you want things like momentum matrix elements, I believe you have to use norm conserving uh, pseudo potentials. Um, I don't know if of the major other differences, relativistic pseudo potentials are mostly uh, needed for things like, let's say you're you're uh, trying to see the band structure of gold, or you're trying to look at the band structure of, let's say, platinum. Things with uh, where you have strong uh, spin orbit um, uh, interactions, um, and uh, so in those cases, you might want to use a, a relativistic uh, pseudo potential. So let's say, for instance, so some time ago I was looking at um, momentum matrix elements of gold. All right, and I wanted to get a very accurate uh, result. So I used uh, a relativistic pseudo potential and, and a norm conserving pseudo potential uh, so that you know I could get the momentum matrix elements and I could also take into account the, the spin orbit interaction. Um, you can also, this is relevant for gold. Uh, in a lot of cases, DFT does not uh, do a good job of showing you where uh, for instance, the D bands of gold should be, right? So in gold, the, the main tr optical transitions are from the D band to the SP band. Um, and so in those cases, you can actually do a DFT plus U where you add, you artificially add a, uh, a, 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 a potential to just the core, uh, the D electrons basically. And then you can basically move the D bands to where they are experimentally. Um, so, so, uh, so I take it like this has to be used very closely in concert with with experimental data to make sure that you're you're picking the right thing from the sort of panoply of options. Yeah. So um, that is um, one of the issues. So DFT does a very good job. For a lot of uh, for a lot of elements, for some things like let's say gold, it will give you without any sorts of modifications the uh, the general structure of the of the of the band structure. The S P bands will be exactly where they should be. Even the D bands will mostly be where they should be. But let's say you're looking, you're very interested in the particular uh aspects of let's say the dielectric function of gold now that is highly dependent on the exact transitions right and so in that case you do have to look um 
uh, where they are experimentally, I guess, and, and add a U term that um, that uh, allows your your computational results to be uh, to be consistent with the experiment, I guess. Um, yeah. Uh, it also, I, I haven't ever tried to model uh, anything with uh, uh, f orbitals, but I've been told that in those cases also, the you you need to be very careful with these uh, DFT plus U um, calculations. Um, I guess, uh, yeah. Also, I, I've never really, I guess the, uh, the spin orbit interaction does change things a bit, but it doesn't seem to change things all that much for, uh, for the, at least the observable quantities that I'm looking at in, in gold. Um, yeah. Oh, by the way, I've, I've been saying a lot about, you know, you can do spin orbit uh, interaction calculations, et cetera. So the, the good thing about DFT, most DFT packages, you can choose whether you want to ignore spin, whether you want uh, a Z spin, whether uh, you want um, uh, a, a spin, but it's not constrained to be either up or down on the, on the Z axis, or you can do spin orbit. Um, and those are all uh, perfectly allowed. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, the one issue that you do have to be cognizant of is let's say you want to know if a system is actually magnetic. Um, you set an initial magnetization of the system, but then you also have to be careful that the temperature at which you're computing everything is low enough so that you can it, it's uh, so that it's um, so that you can actually uh, see the magnetization, right? Because let's say you have two. Uh, spin bands and they're very close uh, and the temperature is very high, then they'll pretty much be equally occupied. Uh, and then you won't see that there is actually a magnetized system. Um, so, but those are just fine details, uh, but details that, uh, you know, wasted uh, untold hours of my life. Um, so, um, yeah. So let's go into some actual, like what, what I'm interested in, right? Okay. So, um, just a quick oh, question. Uh, so is there like a formal justification for the U-term or is it more like an ad hoc thing that you put when you don't get like the right band structure? Because my understanding was that like the, like the functional that you use for this exchange correlation already includes Coulomb interactions, right? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, from what I've read, um, it does seem to be very much an ad hoc thing. Uh, so the papers that I've read uh, have been primarily by, um, there, there are a bunch of uh, papers by Prinao Narong's group at Harvard and by um, uh, this guy Ravi Shankar, uh, who is at RPI, and, and they've been looking at a, a lot of these plasmonic uh, metals like gold, um, uh, silver, you know, et cetera. And so... And in those papers, they go into exactly which U parameters tend to give the correct uh, experimental results. Um, it, I don't think they, from what I recall reading those papers, there's no real justification as to why those U terms have to be the way they are. Um, so it, it, it does seem very much that it's um, kind of figure out what the band structure has to be and then adjust uh, accordingly. Um, but uh, I, I could have also missed something um, in reading those papers. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so, so uh, now I'll go back to basically why I ended up using uh, DFT in the, in the first place. Um, the, uh, so what, I, what I'm interested in uh, typically are, are um, Observables like the non-local dielectric function, let's say uh, momentum matrix elements, electron phonon matrix elements, and just as important, what the phonon dispersion of a system uh, looks like in a, in, in a complicated system, right? It, if it's just graphing, for instance, a lot of cases you can just solve a lot of things uh, analytically. 
Uh, but let's say you have so the systems that I'm looking at are maybe uh, 18 atom unit cells. That's not uh, an easy thing to solve uh, analytically. Um, so uh, the good thing about DFT, um, it is you can get a lot of uh, physically relevant information. So th these are all screenshots actually from a bunch of tutorials that I looked at uh, last year. Uh, on the JDFTX website. Now, JDFTX is a very good DFT uh, package. Uh, if any of you are interested in getting started, uh, I would definitely start with, with this. Uh, the common DFT packages are one like Quantum Espresso, VASP, uh, and Abinit, uh, but uh, none of them have very good documentation. Uh, and especially if you have issues compiling this or uh, issues with uh, compiling with additional libraries. E everything is very uh, well explained uh, in the JDFTX uh, tutorials. Um, and also, uh, the there's a very good issues page on GitHub. So if you have any issues, uh, Ravi Shankar will, will, Shankar will pretty much reply to you uh, uh, very promptly. Um, but one of the issues in DFT uh, is typically you're solving things on a K-point grid in uh, in the Brillouin zone, right? And so uh, for things like the density of states, for instance, you're not gonna get good graphs, right? If you look at this uh, black curve, th it's very spiky, it's not great. Um, but what you can do, uh, and I think this was pioneered at UC Berkeley some time ago, is, is you could do uh, a wanierization, which is basically you can map your DFT results onto a type binding type uh, a uh, type binding type um, problem, and using that uh, you can actually get um, uh, a density of states that that matches um, uh, that matches better up to a certain energy. Uh, so this is basically what one ionization kind of looks like. Uh, you have the uh, original DFT bands, and then you choose a window of states that you're gonna look at. So maybe you're only interested in the uh, valence bands because, and those will be well described by one area uh, type binding orbitals because they are highly localized, right? Sometimes you may have issues with convergence with the conduction bands because those are delocalized over the entire system. But in let's say silicon, uh, they will be, uh, high, the valence bands will be very well described with, um, very well described by uh, one uh, type binding orbitals. Uh, you can also do this for metallic systems like uh, uh, aluminum, uh, where you can set an inner window and an outer window, uh, which basically determines w uh, what range of energies it's gonna look at to create the orbitals and then what range of energies it needs to basically fit to. Um, and there's a lot more information on the JDFTX website if you guys are interested in this. But one of the good things, one of the great, one of the great things about one uh, one ionization is you can basically use it to give you uh, a, a K-dependent Hamiltonian, this you know this H sub K, uh, which uh, you can use to get, get give you the energy at any point in K space, right? So typically, if you do DFT. Let's say you're doing aluminum, you just do, do a 16 by 16 by 16 point grid, but then you'll only know the energies at those points. And then maybe you can interpolate it, interpolate it, but that's, uh, it, it won't give you a great result. But in my case, uh, what I just did was I just made, uh, I'm looking at one defect band. So I didn't even have to do one ionization for all the bands. There's something like 72 bands in my system. I'm not interested in all of them. I'm only interested in uh, the one that is half occupied, let's say. And so if I just do one ionization for that one band, then I can know the energy of that one band everywhere. And just knowing the energy of that one defect band, you can get a lot of um, uh, 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 important quantities of the system, um, which I'll go into a little bit. You can, go, you can get the density of states with a very high accuracy. Uh, you can get matrix elements. You can do the wanderization and then uh, use that wanderization to interpolate the uh, momentum matrix elements everywhere in the Brillouin zone. 
uh, and uh, you don't have to do extraordinarily um, a fine uh, Brillouin's own meshes in order to get um, good results. Um, and then you can combine linearization with uh, phonon calculations in order to interpolate electron phonon matrix elements. Uh, and you can get things like uh, the resistivity of a system due to um, uh, phonon related scattering. Um, uh, you can get this, uh, I forgot what this thing is called, but it's related to superconductivity. Uh, it has a good name, Eliasberg uh, spectral function, I think. Uh, it Macmillan function? Sorry, what? Uh, I've known this thing as Macmillan's function or something. Oh, okay, I, I think I've heard of, uh, I think I, um, Saw it referred to as the Eliasberg special function, but it, it, it's possible. Um, and then you can also get the, uh, you know, the phonon dispersion. So this is just the phonon dispersion of graphene. Uh, I'll go into some of my own calculations later on. But then, uh, oh right, you can also get things like this m epsilon uh, as a function of omega, and this is for something that is um, uh, free electron light. Uh, uh, I think this is actually for aluminum. Uh, but yeah, so I'll also go into some stuff with, uh, JDFDX. One thing to note, if you use JDFDX, everything is in Hartree atomic units, which is very convenient actually for a lot of these calculations, but it is something you need to keep in mind. Uh, it is, uh, GPU comp capable and MPI compatible, and you can compile it with additional libraries if you're interested in, uh, really odd functionals. Um, uh, and then I'll go into some of these actual DFD calculations. By the way, all of these that I'm showing up are pretty much, you can do them very easily on a, on a local, uh, on just a, um, like I, I've, did, I've did done them all on my Mac. Uh, I've used a computing cluster for some defect calculations that have been uh, computationally intensive and also because I don't have any GPUs on my, on my Mac, but uh, out of curiosity, what yeah. uh, cluster do you use? It's it's this uh, actually Peter here. Is he's still here? He actually helped me set everything up. It's this Plasma MS uh, cluster that we use in the Got it. group. Got it. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so these, these I, I I thought I'd show you, you guys some some of these uh particular calculations. I have. I have them open as well. And so if you have any other questions, I can go into the actual code. Uh, but so this is a, a system uh, we term it BN33BC. Basically, it's uh, boron nitride, uh, two dimensional boron nitride uh, in a uh, supercell, a three by three supercell. And then uh, in each unit cell, we take out one of the uh, borons and replace it with a carbon. Uh, and so the reason we're interested in a system like this is uh, because uh, it, it can very likely support plasmons of low loss because you basically have one defect band uh, in the middle of the valence and conduction band. So you don't have a lot of uh, transitions, but it's a highly localized uh, defect band. So you don't have uh, uh, a lot of transitions between, uh, between that band and the uh, valence and conduction bands. Um, and also because the hopefully, well, I'll show you guys the phonon dispersion later on. Uh, it will also prevent phonon uh, assisted transitions, at least to the lowest order phonon assisted uh, transition. But one of the interesting things about this system is that <clears throat> due to the highly localized nature of the, of the defect wave function, you actually get a splitting of the spin, split, uh, splitting of these spins. Uh, so you get this uh, spin down band and then uh, this uh, spin up a band that are that are separated, um, which was not something that we had thought it would happen uh, uh, when we first started uh, studying this system, but uh, but it does actually happen. Um, and so, by the way, this is a linearization, and this is the exact uh, band structure. I just kind of wanted to show what they are. Uh, uh, how similar they they look, yeah. Um, and then using these uh, uh, one-yearized uh, wave functions, you can get things like the uh, 
imaginary value of the of the polarization for um and this is a non-local quantity uh basically all you really need to do the uh in order to find this uh if you just use a one band approximation is from the dft data as long as you have some function that gives you the energy at all locations uh you should pretty much be set uh if you want to include all the bands uh which i do later on um you also need the uh the wave function so you, dft after you want everything you can get this uh k dependent hamiltonian which in this case would be like a 72 by 72 hamiltonian if you're looking at all the bands and then uh at each point in k space it'll give you an eigenvector uh and then um it'll give you uh you know 72 eigenvectors 72 um uh eigen energies and then you can basically use those in order to calculate the uh, non-local polarization and then using kramer's kronig what you can do is you can take these and then get the real value of the polarization uh because they're you know related by uh by the kramer's kronig relations uh, and that's exactly what I did here. So for instance, and you got this nice uh, plasma curve, um, which, uh, <clears throat> we, we, and this is only looking at intraband stuff. So when you look at all the bands, it actually gets dampened, it gets lowered. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so that's, but that's all from the uh, DFT as well. You can also look at, for instance, the, uh, the photon dispersion of, BN33 BC. So here you would have um, uh, the uh, most of these are just the folded up bands of uh, of BN. There are some minor differences, but uh, mostly we were just doing this calculation to verify that they didn't somehow exceed uh, 0.19 or or 0.2 EV. Um, the lower the phonon dispersion is, uh, the better in terms of what sorts of phonon assisted transitions are relevant to the system and then um we're still uh fine-tuning this particular graph so uh we're actually not entirely sure about these uh uh these exponents we have here we're kind of debugging here but you know in the end we're interested in plasma losses and so this is just like a second order fermi's golden rule but what, what go actually goes into here the plasma and electron matrix elements, the um, electron and photon matrix elements that we can get directly from uh, DFT, uh, and then the energies. Um, to get the plasma and electron uh, matrix elements, you need the overlaps and the, uh, and the plasma and energies, uh, and also the um, momentum matrix elements. So pretty much everything here can be given to you from, uh, from DFT. Um, would you use like a similar thing like do second order perturbation theory to calculate like the resistivity when you're doing like the electron phonon problem? Like you showed like a resistivity plot. Is this like the same? Is, is it the, it, it, uh, wait, could you actually repeat it just, just so I understand? Uh, just yeah, so sorry. Um, so you showed a plot of the resistivity, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, uh, for aluminum. You, yeah, and is that calculated in a similar way, like using the like second order perturbation theory and Fermi's golden rule. Yeah, so it's it's calculated um, using the same elements. It's not with uh, it's not with uh, Fermi's golden rule. But let me just see if I can move this. Uh, so let me see if I go here. Good thing I have this open. The, uh, let me just make sure. Yeah, so th this is how it's being calculated. Uh, this is basically the, so it's very similar to Fermi's golden rule in the sense that you have all of these energy conserving, um, uh, and, uh, uh, delta functions, uh, and then it's basically finding the, the conductivity, uh, from this, uh, let me just make sure. And then I believe it's using the conductivity in order to find the, yeah, it's using the conductivity to find the resistivity. Um, so it's doing something, <clears throat> doing something similar here. Uh, in this case, they're not interested in anything that is uh, non-local, so they're doing everything at at um, at uh, 
Q is equal to zero. Um, and let's see. And I, and this is also three dimensional, so it's slightly different because in in two dimensions you have a uh, different uh, Fourier transform of the of the Coulomb potential, which which changes some things, which is why, for instance, um, where is it? yeah, which is why, for instance, this is this is gapless, just like in a uh, a regular two D plasmon, whereas in three D it would it would uh, be gapped at some value. Um, but they're using the exact same ingredients, basically. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. What's the uh, sort of scale of wave vectors that's on the x-axis here? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So this is um. <coughs> uh, make sure. I think this was just from, so this is the, the Brillon zone would be the same as the Brillon zone of graphene, basically. Uh, so think of this as from gamma to uh, one of the uh, vertices of the hexagon that would compose. The, I see. So from zero to K, basically. But yeah, I can show you guys actually, hopefully this is. Yeah, so here it, it would be from like zero to here. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, so th this is kind of what the density of states looks like. So you can see that this is where the, the Fermi energy was. Uh, and yeah, you can calculate the density of states in a similar way. Uh, and then, right, uh, I was, I kept saying 72 bands. These are what the other bands kind of look like. So this, the splitting is all, uh, is just near the, the Fermi energy. Yeah. And then this is the one ionization of all, all of the 72 bands. Anything else? Um, I have like an unrelated question. So um, I think a, a number of years ago, I was talking to, um, I did a master's in, in the UK and one of the people there was doing DFT to look at, uh, try to characterize like topological materials, understand what materials might be topological. Right. But I know like, Computing the churn number requires access to the wave function, not just the density. Yeah. So I, I take it there's some sort of extension of DFT. To yeah. So um, so when I use the uh, when I use the wave function in this case, it's always with uh, after the one ionization mm -hmm. uh, because you can get basically again this K dependent Hamiltonian. I think as right. long as, as long as you have a K dependent Hamiltonian, you can pretty much have you can tell everything about the system, right? So like mm -hmm. in graphene, you can tell the, um, as long as you, have, in graphene, for instance, right, you, you typically do a type binding model. And then from that, uh, you, you, it's typically enough to know what the, what the topological numbers are, right? I would think. Um, so I, I thought it required knowing the wave function. Um, oh, okay. So do you, do you mean even more than just the, you mean like the, um, even the basic functions? Uh, or, or so for instance, I mean, so like in, in graphing, let's say you, let's say you have like the, I guess the, the Haldane model isn't that, isn't that physical, but if you, mm -hmm. that's still just a um, uh, tight binding model, right? And, and that still just gives you uh, what, what the uh, you know the the churn number of that system, right? And so in this case, it, mm -hmm. it would still get a, like a k-dependent Hamiltonian, which, uh, which right. Would, so, yeah, I, I think you can also export what the exact cone sham uh, states are. I don't think I've ever had to do that. Um, 
Yeah. I also do know there is a very good software package, I think in Python. Uh, but it's it's type I think it's called PyTB. I don't know if you ever if you have ever used it. It's made by this guy at Rutgers, I think, uh, David Vanderbilt. But I used it some time ago when I was still looking at um, uh, type binding models. Um, mm -hmm. And that has a, a lot of interesting functionality. So yeah, I OK. Think, I, I just looked it up. Topological yeah. type binding models. Yeah, yeah. National Mag Lab yeah. has some presentation on it. OK, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, I actually think this is what she was talking about uh, at the oh. time. Nice. Um, yeah. Because I remember her talking about some sort of Python laboratory. Yeah, it's a very good. Uh, it, I haven't used it that much. I think uh, it's uh, I, David Vanderbilt's book on uh, fairy phases, I think, uh, has a lot of computational exercises that use this. Mm -hmm. So it's. Uh, uh, I think I was using it as I was reading through the book, um, but it's a very good, uh, it's a very good book uh, and a very good uh, Python. Um, cool. There is a, so I typically use uh, uh, either Julia or Python to um, actually analyze most of the, the DFT stuff. The good thing about JDFDX2 is he has a lot of example Python scripts. Uh, so you'll mm -hmm. know exactly, uh, a lot, you know, in a lot of DFT packages, um, let's say you're doing a spin dependent calculation and, and you're trying to figure out way which which number actually corresponds to what spin, right? It's uh, very complicated, but here you can pretty much uh, reverse engineer everything by looking at his Python scripts. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's also free, so. Yeah, that's very nice. Yeah. I kind of had a just quick follow up to that. So I guess um, I guess for are you treating essentially the the cone sham orbitals as like your basis functions or how, how does it connect with the because uh, DFT, I guess, is supposed to approximate this like many body uh, uh, density, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so are, you, are you saying in the in my post processing? What am I doing? Yeah, yeah. Like when you show these band structures and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, let me actually see. So, uh, what 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 ends up happening is when you get this, um, when you uh, uh, use this uh, linearization. What, what you can do is from that, uh, you it gives you this ab initio type binding model. And from that, you can make a completely separate model, which is basically just uh, a K-dependent Hamiltonian, right? So in that case, you're, you're not even looking at the cone sham orbitals. You're literally just making uh, a type binding model. But the issue is from, from what information do you make a type binding model, right? Uh, and in this case, uh, the type binding model that you get from DFT is very accurate because uh, one, it can treat different spins different, uh, or the spin up and spin down states uh, in separate type binding models, which is something that you, you, you can't really just guess um, um, from, the, from the start. Um, but in, in the end, you don't actually need the cone sham orbitals themselves. You see what I mean? So you like, I said, I guess you just compute, a, you just use this new Hamiltonian to compute, to do all your, exactly. your post process. Yeah. And then this is, and um, yeah, I guess like, how does it fit to the DFT? How, I guess, how does this work then? How does it fit to the DFT to oh, approximate, okay. yeah. So, um, the actual linearization, uh, there are some papers that have been written about it. I'm not entirely sure how it works. The way that I make sure that, that it does work is I look at the band structures and I see at the K points that I do know where what, what the value should be. If it fits, then, it's, then it should be pretty much good to go. Uh, it also tells you uh, 
very conveniently if it's converged or not. Uh, mm -hmm. And so if it has converged, then uh, ostensibly it should be uh, it should be reliable in terms of uh, approximating matrix elements, uh, things like things things of that sort. Yeah. But, but this is yeah. Well. And you and you can get all of this just from one DFP calculation, or do you have to to do multiple? So typically the, the order of events is yeah you do a self consistency uh, calculation uh, if you need to or if you want to do more k points you can do a non self consistency calculation that uses the electron density from the previous calculation if you're interested in uh, let's say uh, yeah the things that I'm interested in you would do you would make a bunch of guesses for the for the one year orbitals because you need to give it some initial guesses. And depending on what kind of a system you have, you would give it you know, spin up or spin down guesses, whatever. Um, those are the fine details. You Then you, you would also do a phonon calculation uh, in order to see what the, where the phonons actually are um, in terms of energy. Uh, and then in the one year calculation, you, you would, depending on whether or not you're doing a phonon calculation, you would do the one year before or after if you're, if you want to be able to interpolate things like the electron phonon uh, matrix elements. Um, so I guess that would be for something like this, it would be like three to four calculations total. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess the, I guess for the, the computationally is the bottleneck still like the 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 self consistent DFT calculation and the rest is fast or is it? Uh... Oh, I see what you're doing. The oh right, the phonon calculations can be uh, can be very slow. Um, mm -hmm. Thankfully, on a cluster like we have, it can do each K point basically. You know, it can parallelize parallelize the K points. And what you can also do, uh, and I think this may be unique to JDFEX, is so in a lot of systems, um, it separates the phonon calculations depending on the symmetries of the phonon calculations, and you can run each of those separately as well. So you can parallelize in basically two different ways. Um, uh, but yeah, so by far, I would say the phonon calculations are the slowest. Yeah. Especially for large uh, unit cells. Mm -hmm. where things are a little askew so it doesn't have exact symmetries right so in graphene i think it's it splits up everything into two separate uh symmetric calculations and so it can be very fast yeah there you All right. Well, yeah, if there are no more questions, thank you, Ali. That was that was good. Thank you. I enter a lot of these computational talks knowing next to nothing and come out knowing something. So. Would you recommend DFT to a friend? <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I would not recommend DFT, but I 100% would recommend it if you want to use uh I very, I very rarely, uh, you know, uh, want to, um, or, 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 or try to complement a piece of software a lot. But JDFDX is, is very well written. I mean, uh, I am uh, very much uh, computationally inept, and I am much less so now that uh, because I, I feel like Chancellor kind of knows what what is missing in the. Uh, a lot of the DFT tutorials and a lot of the DFT software. So I, I think he's made very, um, very easy to use for a beginner, um, especially compared to pretty much every DFT software that's out there. Uh, I know that VASP also has very good uh, documentation. And I think uh, also because because you pay for it, uh, they, they have a lot of people that you can actually ask for specific help. Uh, but it, it is kind of, I mean, it is expensive. It's like a few thousand dollars, I think. Actually, many more than a few thousand dollars, I think. I think they require you to buy 
many licenses all at once. Uh, so initially I wanted to use Vast, but then, uh, yeah. But I'm actually happy that I didn't because this is a lot better. Wow. So are there institutional licenses for that then? Like does MIT? Oh, no, I, I don't think that MIT has an institutional license. It's, I, I remember when we were discussing with Marin, uh, yeah, they, they were basically like, yeah, you have to buy 10 BFC licenses <laughs> or something crazy like that. And I'm, I think I may be, I may be wrong, but I think I'm the only one in the group who uses BFC 10. Pretty sure you are, yeah. Okay. Well, it's uh, yeah. It's it seems good that it, it seems like a thing where like good tutorials and good documentation is important because it seems like there's a lot of like insider from experience knowledge yeah. with regard yes. to like what, what works ad hoc. and yeah. what doesn't and like you know because you can run the thing and it'll spit something back out but it seems like there's kind of an art to knowing whether or not what's yeah. getting spit out at you actually means something or not. Yeah. No, that's. that's very much uh very much accurate i've also yeah several people at, at harvard have also been very helpful in, in uh, some of their computational groups um uh so they they helped me a, a, a bunch when i when i got results that didn't make any sense um uh jenny Poulter, i don't know if any of you know her uh and uh i think that's pretty much it Nice. All right. So I think uh, next week we would have had G1 to talk about uh, composite Fermi liquids and non-commutative geometry. Uh, but he emailed me and said that uh, he actually thinks that, you know, maybe there's some extension of the work that he's working on. So he wanted to push that off. So the next time we meet will be in two weeks to hear about photonics from uh, Jameson. All right, see you guys.